This is Doreen with the Audio Percolator. And we are here today to have a very interesting conversation. And we ask a question, is there any value in postmodern society to access artworks via the responses of trained experts? And what do these responses tell us about ourselves and our surroundings? Well, we're here today with artist and educator, Dr. Leo Twiggs, and art historian and philosopher, Dr. Frank Martin, to discuss American art and the African-American aesthetic. And this is something that we wanna talk about at this time as regards our national, con national consciousness. With that in mind, I wanna thank both of you from my bottom of my heart for the two of you being with me today. Um, welcome. And I wanna turn the, the mic over to Frank Martin, Dr. Frank Martin, to introduce our very special guest, Dr. Leo Twiggs. Well, I'll start with I'm probably Dr. Frank Martin in part because of Dr. Leo Twiggs, who encouraged me every day to go back to school and get that terminal degree because he said that it was important as a kind of membership card to give authority to the ideas I had about art theory. But Dr. Twiggs is the foremost Batik artist probably operating in America today. He's um, certainly a modernist. He has his own unique aesthetic uh, his works are interesting, fascinating, without being extremely controversial, which is interesting, as we'll see when we talk about his imagery. He has won every conceivable prize <laughs> that is offered in our region. He's, uh, he has the um, Order of the Palmetto from the state of South Carolina. He's won the Elizabeth Verna O'Neill Award from um, the South Carolina Arts Commission. He's in the South Carolina Ar Ar Hall of Fame. He was the first African-American to graduate with the terminal degree in art education from the University of Georgia at Athens. So he is an extraordinarily authoritative individual in terms of um, one of his specialties was actually aesthetics and interpretation as well as art education. So Dr. Twiggs, have I left anything out? <laughs> You did everything, right? You got everything. <laughs> it's everything there. As you always do. Well, you trained me well. <laughs> welcome, Dr. Twiggs. Welcome to you. Thank so you. excited to be able to spend a little bit of time with you on this February 21st, yeah. 2021. Yeah. My birthday oh. is February. I was going to say, Dr. Twiggs is a February child. John uh, Lewis's birthday is today, but this also happens to be the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. So we're recording this on the 21st. So it's poignant and interesting that we happen upon this particular day. A true black history uh, conversation. I remember, I believe uh, Malcolm X was born around 1925 because I remember that the one of the, um, we had talked about that, one of the uh, major hit records of that time was Nobody Knows the Trouble I Seen by Marian Anderson. And it was, it was a point that I remembered to, to give context to, to people. People see Malcolm as, as a very modern individual, um, born in 1925, though, you know. So um, I want to get started with some questions that will we'll get this conversation going. And I'd like to start uh, by addressing Dr. Twiggs. And, and of course, at the same time, you, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, Dr. Twiggs, what are some notable lessons that you've learned that you can share from your experiences as an artist and educator here in the United States, and I guess that have impacted your perspective and the direction that your work has taken? Well, you know, we create out of our own experience, out of our, the results of our own encounter with the world. I was born in the South, and I went to NYU and the artists in Chicago, but I came back home and then University of Georgia. And I think by staying in the South and not leaving, um, I had my finger on the pulse of what was going on here. And several other people have, have done that as well. Faulkner did not leave Mississippi for long. Um, but some of our African-Americans artists left because they had to, the great migration, they just had to leave. But I stayed because I wanted to see the evolution of what happened in my life and what's happening around me and how I can express my ideas about those things in my art and in my teaching of art. Because one of the things I wanted to do 
was to create artist teachers, not just art teachers. Artist teachers are teachers who create art while they teach. And when you create art while you teach, there are several things that can happen. And first, your students see you as a creator of arts and not just somebody talking about art. And then when you start working, you can also show your work. And when you show your work, it says something about you as an artist. So those are the kinds of things that prompted my early work here as uh, a, a person who born in South Carolina in a very small town and created the directions that I've gone. So I'll just add in that Dr. Triggs helped to populate the South Carolina schools with a diverse art teaching or art education uh, group of, of students. And that transformed education in South Carolina. So the state is indebted to him in terms of diversifying who is introducing creativity to the students in the, in the public schools. Well, that's so true, Frank. You know, what's amazing is um, when I started uh, teaching uh, in the public schools, um, they had a, a program where uh, teachers, students um, could uh, win an award for their artwork. And it was the first, this is the National Scholastic Art Awards. And so I had my students enter and we were in a segregated school system. And so the National Scholastic Award said, we will not take students separately. We will have all students together. And my students won everything. In <laughs> fact, the governor uh, presented the awards and he would call the names and my students, I saw in them, it changed me because I saw how proud they were walking up. They were, the, we were the only black schools there and they would say John some and he'd stood up and I saw that proud walk and I was sitting on the edge when he came back, I saw the expression on his face and I knew that he had been changed and he would never be the same again. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was so important to see my students excel. In fact, we won so many awards from the, from the, the, um, the um, National uh, Carolina Art Association until they stopped coming down to the schools to, to even present the awards. They would send it down there and then we stopped entering. But it was so important for my students to excel. And to this day, sometimes they call me and say, you remember when I won that award? <laughs> Sure, I remember when you won that award. Mm -hmm. And I had, it, it's amazing that um, Eugene Robinson, whom you see all the time, uh, associate editor, of the Post. Post, yeah. he was one of my students. He was in one of my classes, won an award. So this is a nationally uh, syndicated columnist and an editor for the Washington Post out of Orangeburg, South Carolina, who was taught by Dr. Triggs, who yeah. is obviously very creative. It's now a collector of Triggs' works, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that is important here is Dr. Twiggs is not telling you that this was actually a peculiar benefit from segregation because Dr. Twiggs had this extraordinary education. He went to, I didn't say before that he went to the Art Institute of Chicago, he went to New York University, and then he went to the University of Georgia. So because, well, I'll let Dr. Twiggs tell you why he didn't go to the University of South Carolina or the <laughs> local schools. Well, he can explain that. <laughs> Well, it's segregation, of course, segregation, of course. In fact, I went to the Honest Street Chicago because uh, our state would not uh, let you come. And so they gave me the money to go to the Art Institute of Chicago. So I went to Art Institute of Chicago uh, for a while and then I transferred to NYU because they gave me money to go to NYU. And I did my masters at NYU and came back to South Carolina, started teaching. And the University of Georgia came looking for me. I mean, I wasn't looking for them. They came looking for me because they had a graduate program and they wanted some black students in the graduate program. And they were gonna pay my way. I had a wife and three kids, I sure. So I took it and I went to the University of Georgia. We were not the only people there. Some other of my colleagues were also asked to go, but one guy said, I'm not going any place where nobody like me has ever graduated. And so he didn't go. But I went, and of all the persons that went, there were four of us supposed to go. Two didn't go from the first in the first place. One went, two, the two of us who went, uh, he stopped and got married. 
and I was the only one that finished. They didn't even have a doctoral program when I went. They put program in after I got there. And you know, <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things about the University of Georgia is that right now, I don't know when they're gonna have the ceremony. I was selected for a lifetime achievement from the School of Education. Congratulations. And, <laughs> well, well thank you. You know, well but deserved. to say after all these years, you know, uh, as a lifetime achievement, of course, we can't do it because of the COVID, but I had to do a speech via Zoom and all of that kind of stuff. But it was interesting to see how far we've come. And that's why I say when I stay down south and I look at where we've come, come from. And, it, and I couldn't go to the University of South Carolina, but it's amazing. In 2003, the University of South Carolina gave me an honorary doctor of fine arts. Yeah. And this is part of what this discussion is really about, is about the decades of experiences that you have had collectively and w what a value that is and, and how anyone can benefit from the, the information that you've um, managed to put together um, to experience the work you've done, um, the lessons you can teach others. Some people feel that our experience as people of color in the United States is you know, singular and applies to one specific narrative, but it really, it really speaks to a global human family and what they can benefit from listening to those who, have, who are able to articulate this, this American expression. Um, American art, American culture, um, as part of uh, a global society. You know, um, we have limitations. The way we live is not, you know, the way we'd like to live. Um, I think worldwide, people would say that. But um, what we do have that's positive, um, and and how can be beautifully expressed through visual art, is is priceless. Um, I'd like to navigate through some of the work, through some of your work. Um, if you could take drive us through it, you, you, you and Frank. Um, well, before you even go to the work, Doreen, I was going to point out also that Dr. Twiggs is a continuation of the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance because he is a student of Hale Woodruff. Yes. And, you know, Hale Woodruff, of course, was a regionalist um, muralist at first, and then he converted to a, an abstract expressionist style. But he was a mentor for Dr. Twiggs. And of course, Dr. Twiggs then brought that expertise, that insight, that sophistication to South Carolina and mentored those students at the South Carolina State University. And, the, and then that was transferred into students in the public schools. Mm -hmm. So that's important to recognize that legacy, that continuity from Hale Woodruff, who is in his turn, kind of a student of Elaine Locke and W.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And it connects, it connects the entire experience. Yeah. as it, how it relates between the North and South and um, spreads out from there. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, maybe you can expand on that a little bit as we go through some of this work, because there's a lot that I think, um, I read one of the articles, uh, Dr. Twiggs, that talked about how your narratives are, um, are coherent. They liked the coherent, the coherent nature of the storytelling because of the fact that you were using series to tell uh, stories. And I thought that was um, notable um, because sometimes it's not clear um, to those who are maybe the untrained eye as to what they're seeing um, in terms of the legacy and our history or the history. You know. If you go to those first two slides, Doreen, I think Dr. Twiggs can clarify some of that continuity because the first is Nightbird, which shows an interior scene and the second is Dreamers, and I'll let Dr. Twiggs take it from there. So if you go to the first slide, he can tell you, he can contextualize. That's, that's, that's Dreamers, so that's, that's, Dreamers. That, that's the second slide. That's the second slide. Okay, one second. I'm going to just move it up because I think what my computer does sometimes, and you know, you, got, you all know about technology. It, well, there are ghosts it, in, the, in the machine. It moves things around a little bit, so I have to... Make a it few decides. little, absolutely. Yeah, make a few little adjustments here because, for some reason, it's just been moving my first slides to the second. Um, be with y'all in a second. Computer has go. its own innate sense of order. Doesn't it? Oh <laughs> gosh, it's just not okay. But 
they will be making this. Well, they are making decisions for us now with the application there of the algorithm. Okay, there yeah, it is. That's it. There it is. Okay, there we go. Well, you know, what's interesting, and of course, Frank will see this, is that the dates, you see that's, that's 2002. And the other slide is 2018. Mm -hmm. And this there is 2018. Is, mm -hmm. and, and there is, there is a, 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 a similarity there. Because um, I think that if you are, if you are an artist, then you don't jump around. I see folks who say they are artists and they jump around from one thing to another thing and they're doing another thing, they're doing another thing. I think what happens when you start an idea, then that idea can become a coherent net narrative that, that, um, that lingers throughout your work. I mean, I've always been concerned about growing up my brothers and sisters, and what happened to us. This work itself was, I was in my hometown, I have five brothers and a sister, and man, we had to find places to sleep. And I'll never forget that uh, we were in a bed, uh, four of us in the bed, we weren't head to toe, but we were in a bed. And we'd look out, and I remember um, in the other room, there would be people talking and you can hear them, because we are supposed to be in bed and you can hear my aunts and uncles in the other room talking and dad sometimes talking. And sometimes I'd lay in that bed and I look up and I see a bird flying. And with my imagination, I'd say, I wonder what that bird sees flying over my hometown, over my house. What does he see? What, is, what, is, what, what perspective does he see beyond what I'm seeing? Mm. And, and that was a way of using my imagination because one of the things that you have to do as an artist is you have to learn to use my, your imagination. Now let's fast forward to the latest one. And in this particular work, you kind of see this room. Now the room that I, that I uh, talked about earlier is at the back of the house, you don't see it anymore. Uh, this was the house as it kind of sets today. It's very old. And what I wanted to do was in this particular uh, house is to show the obstacles that we have, the troubles that we face. And so I made this house as if the house is falling apart, really. And my mom used to sit on the porch of the house because this is like the house where I grew up. And we had cows. And I like the night. I always use a cloud, no matter what. Dogs sleeping under the house. But here, this is this is a window where you just simply put two two bars across because I'm keeping it there. And this is bolted up. The window is bolted up. But what I did was I made the color like a Confederate flag because you could find pieces of red and, and a blue and you're nailing the house up. And, and this is a poor, this is a poor house. In fact, when I did it, my brother said, bro, that, that's a bad looking house. Our house, I don't know whether, I don't know whether our house was that bad looking or not. I told him, but you don't understand the idea. And what we had to do, I remember it was cold in the house because we had a flu there, this was four rooms. And we learned that if you covered the part, this part, you could get a little warm. And what I did was found these coverings, but on these coverings, they are X's as if people have gone on. You've seen that in a lot of my painting. There's the target where people are target. These are remnants of the trouble we have seen over the years. And dreamers, of course, represent, how could I get out of this? Where can I go from here? What is the future like for me here? And that is a key point that you just brought up. That's a key element. I'll, I'll explain see, why. Let me let you continue. But mm -hmm. do you see the continuity between the two, Doreen? So the mm -hmm. first image was inside looking out, and now yeah. we're outside looking in. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So there's that continuity. And then he uses that, <clears throat> that silhouette 
and that silhouette is very distinctively African. And I think Dr. Chase mm. will probably talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. too. Yeah. But in the other piece, in the in the doorway, you had those shadowy figures that were like protective figures. They're almost, they're like spirits. So if you just go back, can you go back one slide just for a second? You see that form with the hat in the doorway? And there's another child in the corner on the left. Can you see the silhouette there? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Twiggs is always doing this very nuanced communication about the experience of being a child, being protected, the dreamer inside looking out and then the outside mm -hmm. looking in. Mm -hmm. This is These are key points that have been discussed recently. A lot of young people are feeling despair at this time. Suicide rates are sky high going up in various countries. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been having some conversations with a few people about the, the importance of hope and the importance of exploration, looking outside, wondering, as you mentioned, Dr. Twiggs, can I, is there some place for me to go? Is there something that I can do? Or what, what is there to see? What is there to experience? When you get into that process of exploration mentally, that's when you start to conceive hope. Maybe, maybe there is a chance. Maybe there is something greater out there maybe there are answers for me. So that's why I particularly love this piece, um, all the pieces, but I love the way you described what would go through the, uh, the person's mind. And then one of the things I never wanted to do was express a feeling of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I never want to enter into my work, that as long as there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what, that's the songs that they sung in the churches where I went. Right. Uh, you know, I remember I, I was uh, uh, a projectionist at the theater and mm -hmm. black people didn't have that kind of job at the time. Mm -hmm. But I knew how to operate the projectors and the man came to the college and said, um, I want you to come and see if you can operate these projectors because I had done it in high school. And I went out there and I did, I operated the projectors at that. And I remember there were times when I wondered whether or not my mom, because my father had passed early, and my, my grandmother, they, they got together to send me to school. And I remember whether I wondered whether or not they would really have enough funds to put me in school. And I remember coming home one day, and she was kind of down in the, in the dumps. And she started singing the song that says, I think I'll run on to see what the end going to be. And I'll tell you, she just started the song. And when she started the song, I knew that she was going through some tough times because we probably needed some money and all that. And she said, and my grandmother would be in another room. And she said, I think I'll run on, see what the end gonna be. My grandmother would pick up the song and they would sing it together. Call and, and response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, call and response. Mm -hmm. I think I'll run on, see what the end going to be. I think I'll travel on, see what the, and at the end, they'd come together in the house and they'd have a good time. Mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm. that they would be over the trauma or whatever it was about my in school and helping and all of that. Mm -hmm. So to me, it is so important for us to show a feeling of hopefulness. Absolutely. That's this. And the development that we've had through our experiences in this very young country um, have actually uh, strengthened us, strengthened many people in terms of their faith um, in, in a higher power, but also in themselves to um, get it done, to get, the, to get the work done, to find a way mm. uh, to use their, um, their, the best of their ability and to stay positive. And, to, and also to help others, because so many others in our communities and our families, they, they struggle. And you, and you have to take, go hand in hand and work together and help each other through from time to time. So these are the types of narratives and these pieces that are just, um, I believe, universally uh, relevant and needed at a time um, when the earth is facing um, global uh, crises, uh, De, um, destabilization of economies, um, ethnic strife, um, uh, and other types of serious problems. Uh, right now on earth, many people are starving, as, as I know that has been happening, but there are some particular crises going on right now. They're not really being discussed uh, that much, 
there's certain stories that make mainstream media, but these uh, stories that we're talking about just from the work, from, from what's been, from the imagery that you can just understand by looking. Um, I lived in Charleston for a while too, as a kid, but we'll talk about that another time. In North Charleston, yes. So I just feel as though the three of us came together in the funniest way. And I'm really happy about that, but we'll, we'll chat about that another time. Um, well, but the other thing that Dr. Triggs pointed out, Doreen, is how do you go beyond that point where you think you can't go any further? And he said his mother would start singing, his grandmother would join and they would come together. It's community. Community mm -hmm. is the magic that puts us together, that bonds us over, that carries us through. And in this image, you have the protective grandmother figure on the porch, the children protected inside. You have threats because those symbols and semaphores, they look like semaphores, like the flags that you use in the Navy to communicate, but they're targets. There's an emblem, the, the crossed window is the um, being barred in segregation from access to things. There's the crescent moon locating it in South Carolina because that's our symbol. So it's a very nuanced and subtle combination of things locating this in a particular place and get, giving this a certain kind of specificity of experience mm. that makes it incredibly personal and at the same time universal. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that attracts me to Dr. Triggs works. It's subtle, it's simple, but it's extremely complex. So you can't look at these works and yes. think, oh, well, this is, you know, it's just self-evident. It's not, it looks on the surface. Sometimes it looks like it is. And then you look more and the more you look, the more you find. The exactly. And when you're touched emotionally by art, whether it be music or visual art, that's when that simple um, initial reaction opens up into layers of information and experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, I even yes. appreciate the cows that are there. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But see, the, moment of a child. the key is, do you want to look though? You know, and, and, and it's about motivating people to want to take the time to do that research, to, to look a little further, a little deep, to dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's what this is about because that's where the answers are. That's where the insight is. It's inside. You got to go right. in, you know? And right. so this is great because Dr. Twiggs has taken us in. I really, you know, I really think that one of the things about an artist is that you work. You, I, I, I've seen insights into my work by Frank that I didn't even think about before. And yet, when I go back to the studio, I say, you know, you know that, he has something there. Um, one of the things that you just mentioned, Doreen, about um, inside, going inside, I work in batiks, and nobody else is doing it. And I spent a lifetime trying to take that medium, which I'm using fabric, homespun fabric, the cheapest fabric you can buy, the fabric that African Americans wore, my grandmother and grandmother will use for sheeting. And I started doing this. And the reason I use dye is because when I put dye and wax on it and I dip the dye in and I dip another color in, and I dip another color in, I'm using multiple layers of color. And when you do multiple layers of color, usually as a, as a, a viewer, when you look at a work, you stand back and look at it. But with Batik, the closer you get, the more you see. That's right. it, the That's closer right. you get, because you see all these multi layers of color. You can't see it on a slide, but mm -hmm. for instance, there are a whole lot of more colors in here than you see. Mm -hmm. There are a whole lot more colors in here than you see. Because yes. what happens is the nature of the work draws you into it. And I think that's what fascinated me about using fatigue. It's long, it's time consuming, and I've been across the country doing workshops and folks say, yeah, I'm gonna do some of that. And you hear from it later, say, uh-uh, <laughs> time consuming, I can't do that stuff. Because mm -hmm. you got the colors and all of that. But to me, it what it does more than anything with my paintings, it forces me to be contemplative. Mm-hmm, yes, yes, yes. That when I'm working on a work and I think I'm done, I know that I'm not done. Mm -hmm. Because every, every, 
every step takes a little more. You know, you put the dye on, you got to let the dye dry. And then you put the wax on, you dip it, and you got to let that dry. And you put another layer on, you got to let, and you build up these layers over. I mean, this painting took about three or four weeks to do. Mm -hmm. because, and when motivated by love, that's the yeah, beauty of, that's yeah, the beauty of labor yeah. intensive, labor intensive work with, with in but, terms of painting. But it's also art as a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very important because when Dr. Twiggs approaches a subject, he always approaches that subject in a richly nuanced way. It will look simple sometimes on the surface, but it's just not simple. Mm -hmm. It's just not simple. Mm -hmm. Like I'm seeing in this because of the, the pattern of white dots on the base, it's like an inverted sky with the stars on the ground, mm -hmm. which could be lightning mm -hmm. bugs. But if you, if you lived in the South in a rural area, there are things you're going to see in this that are just extraordinary. Absolutely. And so, But that richness of the experience of being Southern and rural is in the work. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, just like, like our families, like, you know, our family members, how they used to clean when you clean house. That's why I like drawing dishes by hand. I don't, we, some of us don't like, one of my collect, one of my friends who is a collector and um, scholar, interesting woman. She was talking about how she and she's from probably North Carolina. We were talking about how we don't like dishwashers and we like to dry our dishes by hand because we contemplate, and meditate and work, work through things that we're dealing with. Cleaning um, is, is, you know, you, you've seen our moms and grandmas do that. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's, it's meditative and it's... it's um, and, and, and Frank, it's surprising that you get that because you notice around the sky and the ground, the, there's no way you can get wet with paint. Right. You cannot take paint and get that. Mm -hmm. And the rocks on the ground, Frank remembers, is when you're down south and you're looking across the fields, sometimes you see lightning bugs. Lightning bugs. <laughs> lightning yes, bugs. yes, yes. And that's immediately what I thought Lightning of. bugs are the stars on the ground. You know? Right. Yeah, a lot of a lot of artists try to do this type of work with you know they do digital work like this and um, mm. it's 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 a visual that that is reminiscent of other work um, in terms of the storytelling because I, I know some other southern artists I'll introduce you to a few people too um, and I see certain um, connections in the work because of our yeah. shared experiences. You know? But like I said, the more you look at this, the more you see because the other thing that's happening is because Dr. Twix has fed his subconscious, all right, that rich, deep blue, that's an indigo blue, mm -hmm. he's using dye. This is dye on cotton. Why were Africans brought to the South? First to grow indigo, which was the big cash crop in South Carolina, and then to grow cotton. And mm -hmm. so he's telegraphed and he's compressed this history into this image. Mm -hmm. So like I said, the more you look, the more you know, the more you see. And, and there, there's a universal truth, mm -hmm. universal truth. The yeah. more you look, the more you see, seek and you will find. And there it is right there. Frank, I know the next image is a favorite of yours. Oh, that means it's, we have known rivers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a weakness for this one. This is the one I, I, if I could collect one of them, this is the one I'd have. I have a couple of twigs that I've been gotten, I've gotten through charity. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this was one of my favorites and the reason it's so extraordinary is because in the poem Langston Hughes refers to as the Negro Speaks of Rivers is the title of the Langston Hughes poem and he refers to four rivers and he includes the Mississippi as the Nile the Tigris and Euphrates and then he speaks of the Mississippi at the end um, and the Niger Delta but these masks are evocative of water spirits and I don't know if Dr. Twiggs was thinking of the Nomo. The Nomo are the water spirits of the Dogon. The Dogon are the people who live in the Bandiagar Cliffs in uh, West, in Mali, in West Africa. And they're a people that did not make a large pool of the um, people who were enslaved, who were captured and, and brought to South Carolina. But this, the idea of the Nomo, these ancestral water spirits is evoked for me in this. And then the fact that the composition inverts and I guess that's a live oak tree, Dr. Twiggs. Yeah, yes, yeah. And then the water swan, and I'll let you talk about it. It's again, it, the more you look at them, you just see more and more and more. Well, you know, to me, it's, it's like looking in the water. And when you're down south, there's a pond there and you look in the pond and you see the same image you see it inverted. 
And, uh, and that, that always fascinated me. Mm-hmm. And it always fascinated me too, that, that when, if you look over and your face is reflected in there, then water runs over your face and created images like these. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it, we have known rivers is from the idea that in Africa, there were rivers. When, you, when we were brought to Charleston, there was the Ashton River, the Cooper River, the Santee River. So we knew rivers in Africa, but then when we were brought here, we were brought here to rivers. So to me, saying we have known rivers is to say that although we're here, we came from a greater place than here. We knew rivers before we got here, and uh, and Frank's idea about that those water spirits, to me, the waters that we saw, even if you in the south and you're looking at a pond and you're walking by, all of those things are memories, our collective memories of what has happened to us yes. and what have been and the Absolutely. ancestors. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that DNA memory, and, and it is often associated with a place like this, a place where you're walking by a river or by a tree or in the hills or somewhere that you might be. Um, and that collective memory is um, something that, uh, that rests with all of us, whether we, whether we want to look at it or not, it's there. Well, the other thing is that as part of the low country culture, the Gullah Geechee culture, which I'm sure we'll end up talking about more also, um, one of the practices was to break crockery and place it on a gravesite. And you broke the crockery because it was shiny. That was, that's, a, that's from the Bakongo, another, the Congo River. The Bakongo people in particular would use broken crockery to, especially if it was something white or shiny, to reflect like the glistening moon on the water. And he puts the moon there, you see the moon there, you see the water glistening. And that was to direct the spirit back home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is especially pointed on all these different levels. And like I said, Dr. Twiggs, by his extensive reading, he fills his subconscious with so many things. A lot of things may just show up in his work. Sometimes they're intentional. Sometimes they may just be this outpouring of awareness that, you know, because, and this is bring us to the topic of aesthetics itself, because aesthetics is all about your consciousness directed through your experience to the things of which your consciousness is aware. What is it understanding? What is feeding it? What is subconscious? What is, um, you know, in the direct consciousness? What is unconscious? All of those things come to bear in reproducing uh, an artwork and creating something that is indicative of an inner experience. Yes, and you know, often with with um, when you when loved ones when loved ones are lost. When technology lo- intervening. Yes, when loved ones are when loved ones are lost. Doctor Twiggs, can you unmute yourself now? There you go. Um, when loved ones are lost, often we. Um, feel we feel their loss in our everyday experiences especially when we do joyful things like when we get together to eat or we're in a beautiful place and we want that loved one there and some some of the some of the practices that people have adopted in relation to acknowledging loved ones they have lost i think is just acknowledging the fact that i want this one i want this person to be to enjoy what i'm enjoying to feel what i'm feeling i'm sorrowful that they can't experience what I'm experiencing. And sometimes because of the pain of some of our loss, the deep, deep pain, um, we often even sometimes don't fully enjoy what we're experiencing because that other one can't enjoy it. And so we've adopted different types of um, traditions and things that reflect that that pain. But um, what I enjoy about a lot of the work that I'm seeing, Dr. Twiggs, of your paintings, as I've been looking at, looking at them closer, looking at them closely and over the past um, two weeks or so, um, is that there's this hope, there's, it's the joy, it's the other side of the pain. They're joyful, they're joyful elements 
there's a storytelling that talks about the pain, but then there are these elements that that like spark this other thing. It's 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 a bridge to another part of your consciousness, and it's it's something that's joy joy inside of the pain. You know, it's, it's, I'm quoting an old Stevie Wonder song, um, and I loved the, this um, element of um, underneath the oak tree that um, splash there. Well, the other thing that happens underneath the tree is that, you know, the community would always gather under the trees to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And so that's another evocative mm -hmm. part of this image, if you know something about being in the South. Mm -hmm. True. Um, and I, I, I just love that, the color, the white, the white mixed there, just the, the movement, the activity there. So. Well, to me, I, one of the things about using batik is is that you can get the wateriness of water mm -hmm. and i remember growing up they'd have tadpoles and all of those kinds of things in the water and i could get that i could get that watery look as mm -hmm. if you're actually looking into the water mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the colors are translucent yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yes and that's the thing about dye, because the dyes absorb into the fabric. It doesn't lie on top of the fabric like that's paint right. does. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. it's, yeah, it's it's a part of it's it's in the fiber itself. It's in the fabric itself. Yes. So um, there was some more information that I had um, looked at um, an article that we we shared regarding unforgettable women. Um, uh, article you had sent to me, Doctor Twiggs. Um, regarding this next piece, um, Sarah remembered, yeah. and um, one of my favorites. Yes, <laughs> and it, it, the article called that. called this piece an image of a beloved ancestor from the final generation to be born into slavery, and it says because the artist knew her only through stories, she is depicted in hazy form as if in a faded keepsake, along with a memory box box or a reliquary, as you called it, Frank, I think we talked about that, of objects associated to the tales told about her. Twigs, a native of St. Stephen in Berkeley County, is one of South Carolina's most famous and nationally respected contemporary artists. So I um, was touched by that description of Sarah remembered. Um, what say you? <laughs> okay, now, Sarah is very personal to me. And the only reason you see it here, I was gonna keep it after I did it, but the only reason you see it is before I could get to the gallery um, to tell them to hold that back. Cause I had, it was a part of a big show uh, where I had a lot of flags and I was exploring the, the, um, the Confederacy and what happened after that and all of that. And uh, the, the, the director of the Gibbs Museum in Charleston purchased it. And I thought, that's where Sarah came in, to this country. And to be in Charleston is perhaps the best place for that image to be. This is something that you probably couldn't do with paint. This is a, 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 fa a piece of a, a fabric that's out of cotton, but it's laid on the back of a, of a chair. You can lay it on the back of a chair. And what I did was I took it and cut it in half. And I wanted Sarah to have this kind of elegance around her. Not the kind of elegance that we see in the big house, but the elegance of stained old pieces that's hand-me-downs. And Sarah herself is, a, is, is an image of my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother was seven when freedom came, but she has always, her mother died in childbirth and she was raised by servants. And in fact, some of the servants who raised her became friends with my mom and my grandmother. They said they used to call her cousin Sarah because she was, they, she grew up in the household after, after uh, freedom came. And it was amazing when I was doing this, I had to use my imagination. What would a little girl, seven or eight years old, 
who did not know her mother, whose father was sold off across the river. What was she like? What was she feeling? What did she play with? And so I put this down here. I found an old rubber ball. I found another piece of old fabric, just something that she would entertain herself with. So this was really very, very personal to me. And the amazing thing about this piece is that it has gone to the Gibbs and it's hung in at the Gibbs very, very often. Uh, you know, some museums put these things up and on. But I have gotten letters from people who come through the Gibbs asking me about Sarah, telling me that it was the most poignant thing that they'd seen and that, that tell me the story of it, they would say, because, you know, Dawson would try to tell them a story when they went through, but they, they wanted to know more about it from me because of personal, of my personal experience with it. Well, about, I guess, three or four years ago, the museum did a survey that they call Women at the Gibbs. And in that survey, they had, I think, uh, Gainsborough, a lot of very elegant Western type women and Sarah mm. and Sarah. But tell Sarah's story because that's so when her father came to find her, that's what's so extraordinary is that after the end of enslavement when the family was reunited, Dr. Twiggs, you tell it. Well, she came back looking for Sarah, came across the river because Sarah was, uh, he, he was sold across the river and across the river um, uh, from Berkeley County is Williamsburg County. And when he came back, he said, Sarah, I your pappy, I came to get you. And she said, you ain't my pappy. He said, the, 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 the buzzard laid me and the sun hatched me. You're not my pappy. And I use that sometimes talking to students to show you that in spite of this, all of this, this woman grew up to have 11 children, one of which was my grandmother. And I have an uncle Silas who, who was a kind of guardian angel for us. And yet she made it in spite of all that happened to her. But I was thinking of her detachment. So this shows you the actual, the tragedy of enslavement and displacement but still look at the genius that's come out of this. So people were detached from their families. Here's a child who lost her mother and she couldn't even be with her father. And when he comes back to retrieve her from his love from being separated from her by law, because that's what slavery was, and she doesn't recognize him. So this is the thing that people need to understand when they try to have discussions about what happened to Americans of African descent during the period of enslavement. And this so beautifully and poignantly and poetically shows it. And it continues in African tradition because that reliquary, that little section underneath where the things are there that Dr. Twig says he conceptualized as what she'd find to entertain herself as a child, an innocent child trying to entertain herself, enjoy her life. Um, that is reminiscent to me of the uh, Fong. The Fong are a, an ethnic group, um, I think associated in the culture of Gabo in particular, who would store memories and uh, pieces of ancestors in heads that were placed on altars in a, a sacred space in the community. So it was a way to try to connect and remember something of the past. And this mm -hmm. is almost like a, it's like a poem. It's like a, a, a genetic memory telegraphed into now, which mm -hmm. is why I love this piece so much. Yes, this, um... This tells a story that's also particular to the United States and how yeah. families were separated here in particular. Um, but yet, in spite of that, um, how um, people of African descent in the United States have um, evolved and adapted and connected um, to a global family and um, are now in a position to look inward at that identity and how, and how it's grown um, on a personal level, each of us on a personal level. And this is a, a, a wonderful piece, um, especially for women of color, 
Mm -hmm. um, so I will probably share that during Women's Month next month because yeah. this allows one to start looking inward because there's so much that has to be done inside. And then she once again forged those bonds of love mm -hmm. and generated her own family. And mm -hmm. that's what's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an amazing piece. You know, in order to do that, I went and researched the photos of African-American kids, just research at her, at her age, in, in, her, in her time. Mm -hmm. Just look at old photographs of her trying to figure out how would she look. And yet I wanted to give her this, this feeling of determination. Mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't look like somebody who you should feel sorry for. She looked like <laughs> right. right. In spite of <laughs> in spite of everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, Sarah has command of herself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted and that. That's the thing. That's I what want. that's what people are searching for right now. They're searching for that. So congratulations on creating that piece. Thank you. And um, I think we're moving on to a more, uh, well, it's more of the same. You had mentioned in one of your interviews, I think on, on CBS, that you were talking about how certain tragedies were part of the African-American experience. Mm -hmm. um, this piece, um, marks um, a particularly heinous and difficult circumstance, but yet it's, you know, it's more of the same types of stories. Maybe you can speak about how this came into existence, this piece of art. If, if you go to Charleston and you look up at Mother Emanuel, Mother Emanuel didn't begin that way. It was a brick church and it was a very stately church, but somehow during the, this transition, and I suspect there are some people who wanted it to look like some of the other churches in Charleston. They they painted it and it's white and it's and it's starkly white. When you look at the neighborhood where it is, it is you can't miss it. It is starkly white. To me, what happened in that tragedy is was a stain on that church. And I wanted to create the isolation of that blood stain by using the Confederate flag, because that's what motivated him to do what he did. And then the number nine, which was the number of people that were killed. And if you notice, I tried to do spaces where their bodies could have laid. Because you know, when, there, when there's a murder, they always try to mark the spot off before they move it. And I wanted to show that. And of course, it happened at night. And it was a church. I did not try to recreate Mother Emanuel because I think that ne an artist should never insult the viewer. <laughs> you know, leave something for his imagination. And so I have simply created this sky and the turmoil in the sky at the same time as the turmoil created by the stain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this tragedy touched so many people in South Carolina. For example, I knew Sharonda Coleman Singleton, who was one of the people murdered by Dylan Roof. But the, um, the idea here is the church itself emerges as a kind of triumph over this horror and the, the attitude of the members of the church in terms of uh, reconciliation was extraordinary. And that was one of the things about the incident that was so amazing in the, the forgiveness that was shown. And I remember Dr. Triggs telling me that he was inspired how he felt himself as a church member and a person who, not of this church, but in his own church, when he would, he would also have been at a prayer meeting, I think it happened on a Wednesday. Yeah. And he imagined how that would be um, for someone to come in, pray with the group, be fed, be welcomed, and then to do what, what happened there. And that shows the depth of degradation of the mind of the perpetrator and also the extraordinary harmony and joy and forgiveness of the people who were there in terms of their ability to go beyond that. And the series focuses on the transcendence. It focuses on moving beyond the tragic component to the next level of 
what happens to happen in society to go forward, the reconciliation yes. and, and movement into a, a new kind of being. Which, which it, transcends a building as well. Exactly. It's a, it's a principle. And now that it church goes, was targeted. It beyond. Yes. But it was targeted because it's a church that was attended by Denmark Vesey, who was instrumental in trying to organize an, uh, a rebellion against the, the um, institution of slavery in South Carolina. And that's why the church was the place that uh, the perpetrator ended up using because it was a site. Yeah. yeah, it was a site of community associated yeah. with liberation. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to check something, and we're good. And that's a that was a technical check because <laughs> I'm recording, and I want to make sure that we're that we're that the that's tape is rolling. <laughs> because that um, it, don't get it. <laughs> what we're sharing is valuable information, and um, yes, um, it's a, it's a somber piece of art. It's sobering and somber, and it's well, something the, for me. The thing that struck me was the way Dr. Trees combined the dyes, the red and blue, to make this violet that looks like encrusted blood. And then yes. it's also the symbol of the Naval Battle Jack of the Confederacy, which is a rallying uh, symbol for much of the sort of um, vitriolic, hateful speech that has happened. So, but it, it's mitigated because it's, it has those rough, uneven edges. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol of sadness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary. It's, it's, again, this is a visual poem. Mm -hmm. So this is a, yes. a poem to contemplate. It's not angry, it's not vitriolic, it's not an attack. It is a consideration of something that happened in the condition of human beings and then a movement beyond, it amplifies and moves beyond the, um, the best aspects of what it means to be a human. And that's why that whole series is extraordinary. Exactly. Um, you're, and you mentioned it, but the treatment of the sky is, is brilliant. The With turmoil, <laughs> the turmoil, I, I can, without even seeing it, I can see the sky surrounding the planet. Mm. All of that, it's like a window to a greater, bigger, multidimensional reality. Uh, that's how I see this piece. And it's sobering, you know. Well, it has so, that quality as if the clouds have parted to reveal the moon. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very, very interesting. Um, and, and you treated such a horrible tragedy with so much. Um, it's treated with, um, it's, it's, somber, gen it's a somber, gentle treatment, yeah, but yet it's treatment. powerful, but it's gently executed. Absolutely. So I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. With Frank, um, um, he sees things, but, but there's something that he said that is, you don't know what's in your mind, you know? And so when I'm working, I don't know, I, I, it's not a conscious effort to do it. The only thing I know is that when it's right, it's right. When it's not right, I know when it's not right. I don't always know when it's right, but I know when it's not right. And for instance, the more I look at that sky, I remember doing this piece and I don't remember that sky having the kind of power that it has now. Mm. But that power came from the fact that I knew that that sky couldn't be like some of the other skies in there, mm. that it had mm -hmm. to be transcended, it had to be. And the amazing thing about, about my dyes is some, sometimes I don't always paint on, sometimes I pour it on, sometimes I splatter it on with the brush, and sometimes, like for instance, if you see these dots right here, that's just splatter. I just took that some hot wax and splatter, and the wax keep the dye from holding it, and so it's splattered, but you, you don't know, and when I hear somebody like you guys talk about the work, I, I know that I went through something doing it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and, and you are getting something out of the work that I felt when I was doing it. Like, for instance, Mother Emanuel was a horrible tragedy, uh, tragedy. 
But I wanted people to look beyond the tragedy, to go beyond that, to go inside themselves and say, what could I have done to stop this? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, when I'm doing this, I know that's what I want to do. I don't know well what I'm doing, whether I'm successful in doing it. And yet, when this series came out, there was a video that went with it, and there were people looking at it and crying. I mean, people would come out of the gallery actually crying. And that was shocking to me because mm -hmm. artwork is not like the movies. Yeah, you but know? it's you sobering. Know? I'm telling you, it touches you, it touches you, know, you emotionally. You and sit down and <laughs> everything is dark and you look at the picture. They got the pictures all over. You can select what you want to see. And yet people came out crying. I, I, I was just so moved by that. Mm -hmm. They were touched no, emotionally. They're, well, they're moved by the poetry, you see, because what you've done with that sky is you've made the sky a witness. And what that means is the universe is a witness to this awful cruelty, but also the transcendent kindness and love that it was greeted with. And that's what's haunting. So the poetry, the, the poetic qualities of how you've juxtaposed these images, that's the thing that would, would cause someone to cry. I mean, it, I can understand people weeping. When you see the, when all the pictures are together in the suite, because there are nine images in the series, it makes sense that people would cry. It makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And um, art should touch you emotionally. And um, thinking about whether you care about others is something that, um, needs to be dealt with that's when when you when you get to the, when you get to the the final question of what could i do what can i do you you have to first care and uh, even, on a, even on a, even on a, an emotional level a mental uh, um, an intellectual level you have to start to conceive that others are around you and what they're going through uh, and care but that's the next that's a, ne a next step for some um is caring um Moving on to, in that same vein, um, actually, no, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead, um, but I can go back to this one. Oh, yes. That's the next image. I asked for that to be included. What did you say, Frank? <laughs> I, I had requested that this image of George Floyd's death be included because of what is implied by it. Um, you can see the figure of George Floyd forced into the lower left um, corner of the image, but the, the, the bodies and legs of the four police, the four law enforcement officers who witnessed what was happening and who did not prevent it is the accusation made in this piece that is most haunting and disturbing to me. And then you have the targets. So this was this piece. This is a new piece. Yeah. This was just a big piece I did. Yeah. So and I thought this was extraordinary. Uh, and it captured what caused so much unrest and disturbance in the country. Um, but it does it again without vitriol. It's showing what was horrific about this tragedy that those individuals could witness this and fail to take an appropriate humanitarian action toward another human being. That's what's horrifying. You know, Frank, uh, when I did this work, you know, you remember Picasso did the Guernica and he was reacting to what happened in that, this bombing of that, that town. Right. And this was like that. I mean, I, after I saw what happened to Joy Floyd and just, watched a man die on television. I mean, that was so horrified that I had to do something about it. But the thing about an artist, which you have to always remember, and Picasso did as well, that your anger and everything else, you still got to remember it's art. And you've got to say it in a way that it goes beyond just the horror of the moment, that it takes you beyond that. Mm. And when I was doing this, I remember um, people marching in the streets. I remember these people standing up 
if you notice, I just put the hands up, just hints at it. I think that what I, I wanted to do was to show the kind of nonchalance of those folks, you know, while exactly. somebody's dying. The, the, so at the bottom, the, no, I didn't use black. This is not black, that's blue. Uh, the only place I used black was where George Floyd was, um, down there with coming with that, uh, that expression on his face. And, I, and the flag here, notice I didn't put any stars or anything that people know what that is. You know, they know what that is. I took, I took red dye and I just took it on the brush and just splattered that and just splattered it there. But a part of all of this is the word colored. Hmm. The word colored and this arrow pointing off the page as if he's down here dying with you over here. We see yeah. you over here, you over here. We've killed nine people before, but that's where you're supposed to be over here. Yeah. Uh, and, amazingly, move on. Yeah. And, and, and amazingly, after I did the, I had the painting in my studio, my gallery took it to the, to, took it uh, from my studio because I had done it. And this painting was actually purchased by the um, the seminary uh, of Virginia, the um, it's a it's a the it's um was it West Virginia Seminological? Uh, no, it's seminary? Virginia Theological Seminary. Theological, yeah, right in Arlington, right across the bridge. And okay. it's the oldest one of the oldest seminaries in the country. They're going to be using this as a part of their celebration of 200 years mm. and you know the moment who the guy who was at the at the, in england remember the guy who was in england who spoke in england at the um the the for the queen when they were when they had the ceremony there for the marriage of uh Prince. Oh, for Megan and uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Prince. Uh, I forgot his name. Henry, yeah. Harry. But he's the he's the African American who spoke. Hmm. Oh, the minister. Yes, the I minister. know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was Curry, yeah. and he spoke, and um, and of course he was widely popular because of what he said. Uh, but he is also a bishop, and this movement. This is Episcopalian. Right. Mm. And what they've done is they have, they purchased it right away. And they've framed it. And Frank, this is something that I think you'd want to know. This man said that when they put, took it to the, the seminary that's outside of Arlington, and they had it, they took it to the, the, um, the framers who do the work for the gallery. Mm -hmm. And this framer did um, uh, Barack Obama and Michelle and a lot of work of, that they bring to them to the frame. And he mm -hmm. said that when they took it to the framer, he said this was the most significant work he had seen come through there in a while. Wow. And that was, that's saying something. That's really Absolutely. thing. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. what they've also done is they've purchased this and this is 36, Took me six months to do this. This is 36 by 48. And they want another 36 by 48 by 19, by 2022. Mm -hmm. mm. It's going to be the last <laughs> big thing that I'm going to do. Because it's just, I, I can't do it anymore. I mean, this takes too long. Especially working with dyes. You got to turn it upside down. and Right. But. It's labor intensive, mm -hmm. yeah. labor but it's a labor of love. Yeah, and I and I, I'm so pleased with how it was accepted. The fact that it, I, I this work was so quicker than any work that I have ever done, mm. and for the largest price of any work <laughs> I've ever done, and uh, for it to go and do and and to get a commission to do another one the same size is kind of the pinnacle you know, of my creative career. Well, in this case, the process translates to recognition 
of the thought and effort and creativity that go into the creation of something like this. So, and that's merited, that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. and, and, in, and informing others mm -hmm. of what they might not be aware of or, or what they've been too traumatized to sit down and think about. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, we're gonna move on to this piece. Conversation. Right, now I wanted this one included as well. And the reason I asked that this be in our conversation is because it so clearly articulates the nature of the conversation the country needs to have. Because you have these two people who are in a dial, well, this dialectical relationship. One has a target on his back. One is um, essentially wearing or supporting a Confederate flag. And then you have the arrows pointing to these problems that have occurred in the past. The, the arrows allude to, in this case, the nine from Mother Emanuel in particular, but then that can include also George Floyd. And then you have these vestiges of stars, which enlist the idea of patriotism and these people being in a shared history in a single country, in a shared reality. But these sort of polemical approaches to the experience of that reality and them needing to have a conversation. So I thought this was extraordinary and timely in terms of articulating exactly where our nation is in the moment. Yes, I showed this to uh, a friend who's also a painter and she, um, she's Caucasian and she was like, this, is, this painting needs to be Everywhere. The focal point of a national conversation right now. This is this is what's needed, not so much, you know, rhetoric or whatever. She she wanted this just to be the 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 point of the conversation of a conversation, you know. And well, um, yeah, I, when I think about what was what's going on here uh, with this, um, I was thinking about a, a conversation. It's not just a conversation with black people but I wanted right. to have a multicultural conversation with all the various colors. He's white, but the conversation needs to be about all of us. Because right now this is, I wanna be in charge. This is what we all going through right now. I mean, we're going through a conversation of whether or not we want to be a white supremacist society or whether or not we want democracy. And that's the conversation. Are we gonna embrace white supremacy? Or are we gonna embrace democracy? And white supremacy, if you look at January the 6th, white supremacy has won some people that we didn't know they were there. But you know what Maya Angelou said? When they show you who they are, believe them. That's right. And what we have seen is who they are. This might be an American, not, this, was, this was an America that I knew was there, but it, it danced around the edges. You know, nobody wants to be called a racist. That, that, that they don't want to be called a racist, but we had an administration who let people know, hey, if you want to do that, you do that. It doesn't make any difference what people think. And we are seeing people who we never thought would be in that camp in that camp. And that's sad. That's really sad for our country. But it's also sad for us because we cannot go back. We know what happened in Reconstruction. Yeah, the state of affairs is very bad um, in the world. It shows that there's a need for something that does not exist yet. And so um, that well, is so, clear. Yeah, that raises the issue about moving forward. So you do have these elements in society, as Dr. Twiggs pointed out, it's a, an, a society itself is already diverse. I mean, you cannot change the history of how America is. It, it's, the American society has always been diverse. It was never just one way. There was a predominant group that was shaping what was published or what was presented as official culture, but that was never all there was. And so now as the society moves toward a more egalitarian presentation of itself is creating a shift and it's creating some fear and it's creating some 
concern mm -hmm. in a certain group within the in the culture overall. So the question becomes, how do you open a discourse among these polemical or what appear to be opposed groups of people? Well, the snowstorm that happened in Texas shows you what you need to open as a conversation. Everyone was cold, everyone was miserable, 70 people died because of bad politics, because of bad reasoning, because of poor choices, because of not having appropriate discourse. And so that is the foundational thing. Human beings have to communicate and they have to learn how to share resources. And those who will, because clearly there are those who are unwilling and that's really, there's been enough time and energy spent on that um, right. in terms of um, efficiency and in terms of the, the, uh, where we are in the stream of time. We need to focus on those, or at least I can only speak for myself, I would like to focus on who uh, who's willing to have meaningful dialogue and um, um, progressive conversation, constructive uh, discourse. I, you know, that's what I feel because the, the energy is needed to be, to, to, to make investments of your energy and your time. It needs mm -hmm. to be placed with, we need to work with the willing. And right. we have a lot of solutions. You know, we, we have solutions that are needed in our families, individually first, in our families and our communities. The point course, is there's no single no. solution. Mm -hmm. As you said, the solutions are within communities. And for that reason, those conversations must be had in different places and different contexts with yes. the people who are involved coming to a point of resolution. Mm -hmm. And it's their responsibility to do it. And I like the, uh, the idea of output, which is some of the things we're gonna be talking about. There being, um, a deliverable, an output. One of the things, right. um, one of the things that you've done, Dr. Twiggs, is you've spent um, decades creating output, creating um, art that communicates and educates, that can be learned from, so that there can be meaningful di dialogue on these different topics um, and analysis. Um, so we need to take and we need to treasure these. Um, you know, guideposts, these messages that we're getting from our creative community, from American expression, cultural expression, from, from global cultural expression. But right now we're talking about what's going on in our backyard where we, where we are. And so um, with that in mind, um, there's been some discussion about looking at the past to find um, clues as to where to go in the future or what, or what direction to head in. I, I had, I was moved by this piece, a simple piece of, it, 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 it reminds me of, it reminded me of fabric, fabric art, but you told me it was from grandma's quilt. Yeah. Well, there's, there's something underneath, if you notice the pattern, the kind of, uh, this is a, a, a lighter picture, you don't see all of it, mm -hmm. but there's a pattern uh, on the fabric that's there. And that's the one thing that I, when I started using batik and, and fabric, I found that I could, I didn't have to paint on, on just clear, clean fabric with no pattern. I could find a pattern fabric, fabric and paint on top of a pattern fabric. And it gave me a kind of texture uh, that you see here. Uh, if you got up close to this, you'd see uh, pictures of uh, a, a, a little pattern uh, that, that's mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. onto the fabric that they used you know, back even uh, during the Civil War, they had that calico and they had that stuff on it. Mm -hmm. And so I used, to, I used that. And I got the ideas from the colors from this from uh, my grandmother's quilt. Grandmother, I have a, a quilt. I still had that my grandmother gave to me. And I thought, what about superimposing the flag on top of the colors of grandma quilts? Because grandma yeah. created that quilt under the same oppressive atmosphere that we still are in today. And so the stars would not be the blue and, 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 uh, and the white uh, ground as we saw in other flags, but it would be a flag nonetheless created by grandma hands 
<laughs> what touched me about this was that such an uncomfortable symbol was made to be pleasing. And that's what interested me in your um, re-expression of these flag images. Um, and I, uh, when I was looking at this one, um, I saw the, the pain, but yet aesthetically, <laughs> both images are pleasing to look at if you're just examining art. I know these are not the best reproductions, um, but for our discussion in terms of people who will also go and do their own research on your work and, and go scouring for it so they can get, because I did see some images that were closer up of some of your other flags and other pieces and they had the, um, the fabric um, patterns that you're discussing. You know, but, I, um, uh, mm -hmm. I always saw the flag as a haunting image in the South where I grew up, that everything that you saw, if, the, if you could see all of it, the flag would be there. Sometimes it would be like a facsimile, sometimes it would be just a haze, but the flag is always there because we lived in an era where we were oppressed and we were oppressed because that flag represents our oppression. And so sometimes it could look pretty, sometimes it could look uh, ominous, sometimes it could look as if um, there's nothing wrong there. It's that, but that's the impression that we are given, but it's always there. And however I painted it, it always, it's a flag. That's the one thing that people in the South know that when you do the stars and bars, the St. Andrews, that is a flag. And that is a flag of a country, of, a, of, a, of a, an idea that we, we fought a war over. And that flag is no longer the flag of any representation in these United States. It's an outlaw flag. Mm. Yes. But it was in the Capitol building on January 6th. Yes. <laughs> the flag of a foreign government, the yeah, government hostile. Foreign government. Well, I tell you. To the United States, yeah. That didn't even happen during the Civil War. I know. Exactly. This is interesting in the sense that um, it was pleasing to me to, to see this, the colors and your treatment of the subject. But when you talk about grandma's hands, um, through difficulty, you know, our family members wanted to help each other and, you know, raise us, take care of us. And um, they uh, would take hard times, difficult circumstances and make comfort for the family and make things, make things pleasant. And so I see that expressed in this image. I didn't really understand how, how, what I was seeing until you explained where the image came from when mm -hmm. I finally got the, when I found out the title. So it's interesting to me. And uh, yes. the, the, different, um, the, dif the different types of flags you've done. Yeah. And well, the, the different the, things they express. Mm -hmm. the, 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 one of the things that those flags, they're always incomplete. They are raggedy images of the flag. There's, there's never a complete flag. Uh, always the stars run out on the edges because I want to show them as relics of a time past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that it's reminding me of, well, there are two things that are happening. So what Dr. Twix has done is he's taken this icon of Southern identity and he's transformed it into something that is inclusive instead of being exclusive. In South Carolina, this flag is fetishized because it was designed by William Portier Miles, who later became a mayor of Charleston but who um, fought on the side of the Confederacy. And he designed it because the, the um, actual stars and bars, which was the circle of stars of the Confederate States and the red bars looked too much like the American flag. And so they were in battle, the troops were confused. Mm -hmm. And so this flag was actually designed at first for the uh, West Virginia Regiment and then as a Naval battle flag to be easily identifiable in battle fighting for that cause to enslave claiming that was a state's right, claiming that there was a right to denigrate the humanity of other human beings. And so when 
people are struggling to create some justification for this flag, they really do need to understand the history of what slavery was, of how it separated families, how it destroyed uh, individuals, and what this flag really does stand for in one level. But on the other hand, it also points to this lost cause that many people made extraordinary sacrifices for of their wealth and of their personal, um, well, their personal uh, well-being because they, they, they fought in this, this awful war um, for a lost cause that was in so many ways unjust, but they still seek to justify it. And so it, the flag becomes this symbol of what I call uh, reconcilable hypocrisy. It's a, it's a symbol <laughs> of what people, you know, you, we, we tend sometimes to believe in ideology, we become ideologues instead of aiming for the truth. And what the discourse of art can help us do is it can help us discover the truth. It can help us find ways in which to live in a truth. And that's the thing also that I admire about the works that uh, Dr. Tuix creates. He, he doesn't, he, he's not denigrating, he's acknowledging. That's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this, is, this has been a, an, an amazing journey with you. I, I wanted to connect um, this journey to um, Frank, your narrative, your story, your history too, because Frank and I were looking at images from his family and um, tying it together <laughs> with just life <laughs> of people of color in this country. And I, um, Frank, I wanted to um, really direct a question toward you um, mm -hmm. in terms of what, how your development, um, your journey into the field of art history and philosophy. Um, and maybe thought you could talk a little bit about, I know you, you've kind of talked a little bit about how you got to meet Dr. Twiggs, but I thought maybe you could speak a little bit about your, your story. Well, I can give more details on meeting Dr. Twiggs. Um, one of the people who was a member of my church was Justice Ernest A. Finney, who was the first African-American to be a Supreme Court Justice, um, well, the Chief Supreme Court Justice in the state of South Carolina. There was a previous uh, Supreme Court Justice during Reconstruction um, named Jonathan Jasper Wright, but Ernest Finney Jr. was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he was a member of our church. In fact, my father literally moved them into town in Sumter. And his wife was Dr. Twig's classmate. And so my parents were trying to get me to return from New York because I'd left South Carolina, I'd gone to live in New York. I was working at the Metropolitan Museum and they were desperate to get me back home, back South. And so Dr. Twiggs was looking for a curator. And I think Justice Finney told Dr. Twiggs that you know, he knew about me and that I had gone to Yale and whatever and was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that's how that connection was made. So Dr. Twiggs reached out to me I came down, I saw the museum, the Stanback Museum. I brought my wife with me. We looked around, we said, oh yeah, well, we, can, we can manage, we can do this. And so then that started this extraordinary opportunity to work with Dr. Twiggs. And it was always an incredible pleasure to come to work because he was not only ready with advice and you know, helpful suggestions and protecting me from, because I'm a, I'm, I'm a not normal person in many ways. I'm, I'm difficult, I'll say that, I'll, I'm, I'm a difficult person. And he would look out for me. And How come me I don't know me. that? Well, <laughs> I'm difficult. Well, you'll, if, when I, if I start spouting about my theories about things, you, you'll see what I mean. But he would support me through these um, peculiar bouts I would have of trying to deal with returning home. So Dr. Twiggs, when he returned home, when he came, because he went to Chicago and he went to New York and he came back home and he integrated himself, I think more seamlessly. I had challenges, <laughs> I'll say that. But I was raised in a very peculiar environment um, because my, my home was a place where there was a great deal of intellectual support. Um, I came from a family of educators and there were people who had always, to not find a, not to be difficult, but they had worked hard and they thought well of themselves. They were people who 
were aware of their own capacities. I mean, my uncle was an embryologist. My other aunt was a librarian. Another aunt was an artist who had studied with Lois Jones at um, Howard University. So art was in our lives. I had several uncles who were very accomplished artists. One who I think I've got a picture of him in there. If you bring up these pictures of, of my family I gave you and okay, they let me, explain let me screen share who I am. And I went into art history because art history was a discipline that took up all the space in terms of intellectual engagement. So this was my great grandfather and he was a person who's very, very astute. Um, he, he did not think that the men in the family needed much formal schooling. If you went to about the eighth grade, that was enough. You should be able to figure everything else out on your own once you got to you know, that reading level. That meant you could read the Bible, you could read the newspaper, you could read whatever uh, documents you needed to assess. And so he required the women in the family to go to college. So this is my great grandfather. Um, this picture is probably from the 1870s. And the next one is, my, is his wife. Um, so this is my great grandmother. Uh, and I'm not telling you their names because I want everyone on the internet to know my family's name. But <laughs> I know that's so. And, and that is the precautionary, that's because in our family, you were literally told, all right, you should appear three times in the newspaper when you're born, when your marriage notices are put out and then there'll be an obituary and that's all the, the accolades you really need. And that's how they were. They were, and this, they were this is interesting. And, and, and that's why I'm glad we're showing these pictures because people you, need to see, people need to hear your description of your family <laughs> and understand there. this element of the African-American story. Thank you very much. So they were, I'm not gonna say they were all difficult people. My grandfather was notorious for his temper. He fought a, a duel in Boykin, South Carolina and won in the uh, 19th century and no one arrested him. <laughs> he was allowed to go free. Um, and we have pictures to the generation of the great grandparents. Uh, I have my great grandmother's mother and my great grandfather's mother, we have their pictures. And the next is a picture from the 1880s of my great aunt. And I'm so old myself that she was a person next to my mother and father who was really responsible for raising me along with my grandmother. And this is my great aunt, Anna, and she was just an extraordinary teacher. And the next picture is her as a more mature woman. And if you go on, um, you can see that she has that, that's her with her class. She taught with Mary McLeod Bethune at the Kendall Institute in Sumter, which is a private Presbyterian school because my great grandfather was originally Presbyterian. This is my great uh, grandmother who was a Methodist Episcopal and um, our family, stayed in the church my great-grandmother associated with. She eventually con caused my great-grandfather to convert. And so um, this is my great aunt Anna, and she was a church woman. She was a, also a teacher. And so all of my teachers in the first through the sixth grade had been taught by my great aunt. So I was a very protected person in school. <laughs> and that made an enormous difference for me. I loved school. Now I didn't care for recess. I went to the library during recess because that's the sort of nerdy, horrible little boy that I was. And the next picture is, I think, um, this is her sister. This is my aunt, great aunt Mathilde or Maddie. And so they were, like I said, they were pretty self-aware. They were pretty confident. They were uh, people, like I said, all the girls had gone to college. And the reason my great grandfather insisted that the young women all have college degrees is because he could not entertain the idea that any of his daughters would ever work for someone else. They needed to be autonomous. They needed to have the means of organizing their own lives. So my great grandfather was an early feminist and both, and his daughters were suffragettes. I mean, my aunt Anna, who you just saw a moment ago, wrote essays about womanhood and what women were expected to do. And that's the kind of environment I was forced to grow up in <laughs> with a dinner conversation. And the next picture is of their brother, my um, uncle Palmer, who was a poet and he wrote, he wrote a song about his pride that in the first world war, the war of uh, 1914 to 1918, how proud he was that Americans of African descent could fight to defend the country. And it was called the great war stop, stop raging, ain't you glad? And his claim is that the war stopped raging because of the participation of African-Americans who brought it to a conclusion, which shows you again, this 
this self-confidence that these people had. They were frightening. <laughs> they were the embodiment of that awful idea of the a talented tenth that W.B. Du Bois writes about. And they would have taken that very seriously. They would have read the writings of Du Bois and Aline Locke, and, and they would have felt it was incumbent upon them to respond to that. And the next is, I think, my grandfather. So that's grandpa. And uh, my grandfather was, again, someone who always worked for himself. He had his own property. And he fell in love with my um, grandmother, who's the next picture. And she was also a teacher, but she was known for her wit and her kindness and her compassion. And even as a small child, I remember people, complete strangers, would walk up and tell me these wonderful stories about my grandmother. And I how, love that picture of your grandmother. How delightful, <laughs> what a delightful person she, she was. And unfortunately, she died when um, my uh, aunt was just a child, uh, my father's sister. And so I never got to know her. The, the, the grandmother who raised me was my step-grandmother, whom I love dearly. But um, this is the woman who's the mother of my father's coming up. Mm -hmm. So this is their son. That's my father. That's and you could, yeah, you can see he probably had a pretty good opinion of himself. So, <laughs> and he had to in order to win over my mother, and she was really quite something, um, that's my mom. So wow. she, she would brag, she could literally stop traffic in New York. When she would <laughs> and I believe her, actually, I believe her because mm. of the way she conducted herself, but she was also just the most lovely, thoughtful, intelligent person to have as a mother. And the reason I don't believe in corporal punishment is my mother never ever raised a hand to me. We would reason things out. And that's unusual in an African American family, perhaps. Um, but so I was spoiled terribly is, is part of the problem. And I'm not sure what the next picture is. Oh, it's her grandfather. Yeah, she would always brag about her grandfather who had property. And she talked about his Surrey, his fancy Surrey, his horse-drawn Surrey that he would drive through Sumter <laughs> and terrorize people. But um, she remembered, as a girl, she remembered her grandfather driving about in the Surrey. He was also a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You know, that's the oldest denomination for African-American communities. And so that branch of the family was African Methodist Episcopal Whereas on my father's side, they were Methodist Episcopal. And that's another whole conversation. And on my father's uh, father's side, they were Presbyterian. Um, so yeah, we won't go into all the, the machinations of, of what that meant, but there was on both sides of the family an interest in learning, an interest in reading, an interest in discussion. And our dinner conversations were always lively and interesting. And what's the next one? Oh, so this is this enclave of Americans of African descent um, that were part. This is one of this is my cousin Jean, who is second from the left at Boylan Haven Mather Academy at their cotillion. Mm -hmm. And this is an aspect of African American life that many people aren't aware of. And this was in the 1940s. That's right. And yeah, yeah. so Dr. Twiggs knew about you know these kinds of things that that were part of. Um, what happened. And I think the very last picture may be my, um, my aunt. Now this is my aunt, my father's brother's wife, who was the student of Lois Milo Jones. She was an AKA. She was absolutely thrilled with Kamala Harris being <laughs> the, uh, yeah, because she's an AKA. And Lois Jones was the advisor to the AKAs at um, Hampton, at, uh, at Howard at University. Howard, yeah. At Howard. My sister went to Hampton. This is my aunt who went to Howard. And so she is, or she was an artist. Uh, so she was a painter who lived in Prairie View. And so she um, would come, she, they would come to our home in uh, South Carolina in the summers and we would paint and she would show me things like how to paint with encaustic. Who yeah. was learning how to paint with encaustic? That's but right. that was the privilege of my childhood. Um, so that makes me a, a kind of, not so very odd egg, because there are lots of people I know who have similar kinds of histories, but that's the kind of experience that's not really um, discussed so much in uh, well, within the African American community. Absolutely, which is why I'm so glad. Well, I'm glad too, because I've, I've seen had. things today that Frank never, we never talked about. Because, <laughs> 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 you know, when Frank came up through the black bourgeoisie, Frank, you might as well admit it. <laughs> you were a member of the black bourgeoisie. 
And the reason I got Frank, one of the reasons I wanted Frank to come is because I remember writing these grants and I'd go to the um, organizations in Washington, D.C. And guy said uh, at the end, they'd have some money to put out. And we never got any of that, that money because um, some guy would come up and says, well, I have uh, this grant here and this is from a fellow and he's and he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a graduate of Yale. And he said that these are the things, that, and they would always get the grants. I'm, 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 <laughs> if, uh, African-American, HBCU. Uh, so when, they, when they, they had these people writing these grants who went to Harvard and Yale, I said, well, I'll just get me one too. <laughs> and so I got one too. And it all went from there. The other thing that struck me about Frank is that Frank was in art history. Mm -hmm. And there aren't that many African Americans in art history. And the University of South Carolina had an art history department. And they never had anything, any, any black people in it because they felt that black people came from, did not come out of the Eurocentric tradition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they did not think that blacks ought to be in art, in, in art history. And that's the way it was, even at the University of Georgia. Art history was almost preserved for the Eurocentric white Anglo-Saxon student. Yes, and that's often felt because many looked at people of African descent as being other than American or something else or not human or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But when you well, think of, go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, the problem was people not understanding the complexity of African intellectual thought. And so what was not sufficiently explored were the uh, sort of indigenous um, intellectual characteristics of African cultures. And people were unaware of, there's so much about African history that was hidden, like most people don't realize that St. Augustine of Hippo was an African scholar, or that Plotinus, the inventor of Neoplatonism, which is one of the foundational belief systems for Christianity, was also in Northern Egypt. So this, this lack of information, lack of, infor of understanding and awareness is what mm -hmm. creates a, a disparity in perception. Mm -hmm. And that's also one of the things that attracted me to philosophy. So Dr. Triggs was talking about my interest in art history because art history took up so much space. You could use psychology, you could use um, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of your own technique and understanding of how to make art objects. And you could interpret culture and politics through the artwork. And then that led me to criticism. And then that led me to um, axiology, which is because criticism is about making judgments and axiology is the, is the umbrella study for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up where, <laughs> where well, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing too is that there is a holy grail when it comes to art history. And the holy grail of art history is the Renaissance. A lot of art historians, you know, they might be in contemporary art, mm -hmm. they might be in, mm -hmm. uh, in Greek art, but when you say Renaissance, that's the holy grail. Mm -hmm. And when Frank talked to me, and he had done his, his, his two volume <laughs> uh, uh, dissertation, so to speak, as a master's in Renaissance, that's when I knew I had to get him in South Carolina. Y yeah, because and that's- didn't have mean. anybody in South mm -hmm. Carolina with this kind of knowledge, and Frank had it. Uh, the other thing, and this is a personal note, mm -hmm. is that one of the things that happens in many African-American universities is that, you know, after, after nobody goes get together over tea or over coffee and, and talk about the intellectual things that are going on about um, creativity or anything like that. And Frank could do that. And so his office was down the hallway. <laughs> you know, and he'd come up to my office and sometimes I'd go and we'd have these discussions sometimes late into the evening about what's going on, about feelings, about some of the aesthetics of what I was doing in my work. Mm. And, uh, and it was just such a rewarding experience. Yes. And you can tell yes. by what he said here today, mm -hmm. how important he was in my journey to where I am. Yes. Well, the other and thing is Dr. Riggs left me loose to do those forums to be able to do colloquia in the museum.
-hmm. and we could have controversial discussions because sometimes I would be showing artworks that were controversial. So no one would get upset about Dr. Twigg's works, but <laughs> other works that I would show would send some people like, I remember once, do you remember the newspaper came and they were trying to find something wrong with the show? Yeah. Dr. Twiggs, and I had to walk the, the um, newspaper uh, reporter because she wasn't an art critic. I had to sort of walk her through the show and balance out her opinion. And so then she wrote a glowing article about the show, but she came to be upset. Yeah. Um, and so that was that advocacy for art and for thinking was part of what we worked on together, which is mm -hmm. why I was so grateful you know, to have that support. But Doreen, you're about to say something. No, 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 I'm, I'm just listening. I was gonna say that um, Dr. Twiggs had mentioned um, having done your research about the Renaissance and other mm -hmm very important time periods where history took a turn basically <laughs> and things got changed and uh, the perceptions of people were influenced by politics in certain ways that changed very important narratives. Um, like even in terms of the birth of Christendom as right. a thing um, that really deviated extremely far away from primitive Christianity and also um, other elements on, on the birth of race, which, you know, came also at that time because of fear that existed um, based on conquest and um, war and things of that nature, you know, which we won't get into. That's a conversation for another time because we definitely need to have an art history. That's a complicated conversation. Well, yeah, we, we need to have an art history part one through whatever that probably, <laughs> and I think Dr. Twee's kind of affirmed the, the necessity of that very important education Right. Um, that people can pick up or can, or can delve into or be introduced to through these types of conversations. Well, yeah, race reification has a major beginning in the late 15th century, uh, in the 1400s, and in part because of the opposition against the influence of Muslims and Islam in Spain. And so one of the rallying, one of the ways of, of uh, differentiating because you know, it was the, the Moors who had been so influential in the architecture and the culture of Southern Spain. And in fact, they'd had an influence right up into central France. And with Catholicism and Christianity, that is one of the first wedges that started to move the, um, to try to drive the, both the Sephardic Jews and the Moors out of Europe or force them into conversion. And, around the same time in the 15th century in, in the 1400s, there was a kind of rediscovery of the Ethiopian Christians. Mm -hmm. So that is a very interesting, that is a very interesting mm -hmm. conversation to have. When we do have that conversation, I would like to go back a little further. I'd like to go back to probably the third century, fourth century and move our, and move our way forward because now I'm gonna get excited, but I don't wanna lose the last part of our talk <laughs> um, and I, and I'm, I've had y'all talking for a while. Oh yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Twiggs, you're being very patient through this whole process, by the way. So let me thank you right now. Uh, the name of this discussion is American Art, Aesthetics and Experience. Okay. Um, when you think about your experiences, both of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of directing me, this question to both of you to think about from your perspective. Um, art can be and is a self-actualizing tool. Um, how do you see this aesthetic, meaning the African-American aesthetic, um, as a transformative mechanism that can be utilized by individuals to assist themselves their families and communities as we move forward through this world's crises. Well, Dr. Twiggs go first. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason why is because Dr. Twiggs worked with Arthur Rose, who was his teacher at uh, Claflin, who was one of the first, um, one of the uh, charter members of the um, National Conference of Artists. And so that's the conversation the National Conference of Artists had always been having about African-American aesthetics. So Dr. Twiggs, I'm, um, I'll bow out. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we, we talk about uh, the African-American aesthetics. When you ask a lot of the uh, other artists who were friends of mine, I knew them all. They said, you know, it's black people doing art. 
That's what it is, is black people doing art. You can assign yourself to anything you want to, but it's black being doing art. I began this kind of this conversation by telling you that we create out of our own experience, out of the results of our own encounter with the world. And the, the quote Shakespeare about to thine own self be true is that what you have to do is to be true to your feelings and to your emotions and to the things that, that uh, you feel about the world. And that's what I try to do in my work is to think about those things in the world that I know and how I dealt with them. And there is something to be said about what I call the usness in us. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Washington, D.C., and on that third floor, they have about African-American uh, things that, that we do and the way we raise things and what we do with things. I, I believe that's a part of our African connection you know, that's that that we have. You say it's an aesthetic. You can make it an aesthetic, but it's a part of us. It's the usness in us. You know, you look at that shape of that head that I had. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started doing that, what I wanted to do was a, 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 a image that was postnatal and prenatal so that it transcend just giving birth. It was before birth and after birth. And I made them dark and I made them black and sometimes they were blue, but I wanted them to be a postnatal, prenatal individual that kind of transcends all those other things. You knew they were not white mm -hmm. because that's the one thing you knew they weren't. And I remember uh, some woman coming to me after the exhibit and said, oh, I just love those charming children you have but why do you make them look so lonely? You know, why do you, why do you make them look so sad? I said, lady, I saw some of those same kids when I was coming to the exhibit up there. You didn't see them? I said, they're right, I drove by them. You didn't see them? She said, no, I didn't see them. I said, it's because you're not looking for them. You're not seeing them. So I think that as an African-American growing up in the South, there are things that you learn shortcuts that you learn, things that you learn to make your life better, you know? And so when I listen to the songs that my grandmother sung, when I listen to uh, the music that some of the blues singers sing, you know, I just feel that I'm a part of this. You know, John the Hooker said, big boss man, don't you hear me when I call? Well, you ain't so big, you just tall, that's all. Now, you look, when you listen to those words, you'll see that the big boss man had no power over him because he just said, you're just tall, that's all. And so here's a way of communicating something that is uniquely kind of our own. We do it that way, James Brown, but that thing, I don't want nobody giving me nothing, open up the door, hmm. I'll get I'll myself. myself. Take out the hump. And what have you got? You got something completely different. So those sensitivities that are part of our African-American heritage, whatever you call it, when you put it together, you can call it anything you want, but you know that it's there. And I think it communicates to other African-Americans too, that when you hear it, you know what you're hearing. You know that this guy has been someplace. You can't look, you can't, you can't, go to a play by August Wilson and not know that August Wilson must have spent some time down the street from you. Yes. Look at a Ramar Bearden. Yeah. Yeah. And how does the rest of the world, how can they benefit from this? How can they grow? They see, we've faced a lot of challenges in our lives. We have a lot of, everyone has on some level, but mm -hmm. now we're facing, the national psyche is, is in a state of division. Um, what thoughts do you have about how to cope with these challenges? Well, I mean, I to go to the first question because you asked about self-actualization and then mm -hmm. African-American aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So what is aesthetics? Because um, when people think, when people are saying aesthetics, I find that very often people have no idea what they think they mean. But for me, uh, based on the etymology of aesthetics, aestheticos is the Greek word, which means awareness. So having an African-American aesthetic is simply having an awareness 
of some of these manifestations of African-American culture that Dr. Tweeks just spoke about, certain mm. ways of speaking, certain patterns that you recognize, certain kinds of shared experience. And they're reassuring, they're comforting, they help us self-actualize because they give us a sense of who we are. So um, just the, those, the images I showed you from my family were uh, held by my great aunt. She was one of the images that was there. And because of her self-awareness, that transferred to me. And the same thing happens in community. We self-actualize and the society coalesces around us to help us actualize our own talents. And that is a responsibility of the society to help us and support us in the actualization of our talent. Because when you lose that talent that the person has, the entire society loses. And that goes through this right. conversation thing about division. Mm -hmm. So we need to come together to encourage the genius that we find in each other. There you um, go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's it's support. Yes. People need to be mutually supportive. We're social creatures and we yes. need to perform yes. that socially supportive part of who we are. And it's in us. It's it's ingrained in us. And I think as an artist, I can take that and move that along to other generations. Mm -hmm. If I'm a musician, I could sing it and move it along to other. If I'm a poet, I can say it and move it along to other generations. There is a reason why Maya Angelou is still as popular today as she always was. Because whatever she says, it, it, it applies today. If they, if they show you who they are, believe it. You know, still she rises. <laughs> yeah, still she, yeah, still yes. she still yeah. rises. I, I like what you said, though, in terms of realizing each other's value. And Dr. Twiggs, Dr. Martin, you had mentioned that. Um, coming together, respecting, recognizing, realizing the value that we all have mm -hmm. and how it's necessary for survival and to thrive. Dr. Twiggs, I liked when you talked about how your um, dad told you to look up. Yeah. And also, um, see, it's, 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 it's understanding your own value first. Yes. When you can understand your own value, you can understand or start to perceive others, the value of others, the value of, of life in general, things that motivate you to be more compassionate, to take the high road, to observe, maybe not uh, react, but to observe first so that you, when you do respond, it can be with insight. Um, maybe you could speak a bit about that experience with your father, Dr. Twiggs. I think you mean his son. My son. Oh, I'm sorry, your son. I thought it was, a, <laughs> yeah. see, I got it mixed up. I'm, yeah. You got me lost in a, you got me lost in an August Wilson novel now. I'm sorry. Okay, let's switch this around. Uh, yeah. Well, Please well, share well, that experience that you had with your I son. Have, yeah, my, my, I have my older son, bright, articulate, and all of that. Uh, but when he was growing up, I remember getting on him. Uh, he's 12, 13, I guess, 14 at the time. Uh, getting on him about something he'd done. And when I got on him, he would rub his nose, I remember, or he'd pull his head down and he'd look at up me from side and he would, you know, kind of cower down as if he was sorry, but, um, you know, he was just so subservient and it really hit me. And I remember putting my hand under his chin, my finger under his chin and holding his head up. And I said, don't you ever look down when I'm talking to you. Whether or not you like it or not, look me in the eye when I'm talking to you. I said, because you're growing up in a world where they will take that and believe that you are less than. And nobody in our family is less than. And of course he went on, you know, got his degree, where got his MBA at the University of Michigan, spent a couple of years in Africa. He was coming home one day and we went to the mall and he, he's taller than I am. He's six four and he's straight down there. So we went into a store and one of the guys said, no, that's, that's not it. He said, what? I thought I had created a monster. He said, no, that's not it. That's not the way you don't even understand what's going on. That's not it. And all of my sons developed that. 
And the way they developed it is he was the oldest and you had to be educated. I have my younger son now is in political science, but let me tell you, he knows more about what's going on and relating things to each other because that's what it's all about. You could, like Frank and I had these great conversations because there are certain things that I knew and certain things that he knew and certain things that he saw in my work that I did not see. I'm always amazed now at the things that he sees in my work. And people, other people, like for instance, um, the director of the Georgia Museum, remember? Uh, Frank, Bill, you know him? Bill Island, Bill ended up on my dissertation committee. <laughs> he ended up on a dissertation committee. And Bill Island one of, wrote one of the definitive essays about my work very early on, much like what Frank wrote later on. So, you know, you've got to bring something to the table but you also have to take away something to the table. And the pride that you have in who, you got to know who you are. That's the main thing. I mean, I should have, when I looked at Frank's uh, background and the people he came up with, I can see how he is who he is. Because he, there was never a point when ever, anybody ever told Frank and his family that you're not as good as that guy over there. He always felt that he was as good as anybody around him. And when you come up with that attitude, who can turn you around? And the thing that's really nice, not to um, blow you up too much, Frank, oh. <laughs> Dr. Martin, <laughs> but it, in spite of that, what I found um, you to be is a very calm and compassionate and caring person. Yeah, he is. And one of the, um, uh, I mean, to a notable degree, like, yeah. uh, and, and there's an honesty that you have that I respect you for so greatly because what happens with a lot of academic, in the academic world, I should say, I don't want to say with yeah. academics, but in that world politically is that sometimes people can be intellectually dishonest when you talk mm -hmm. about certain topics and things. And that's something that I never find in you. We could talk about all these different subjects and go <laughs> into them and and you don't try to um take a superiority you're not on a, on a superiority trip but at the same time you use your information and we can go toe to toe it's great and um <laughs> i learn things but then you also allow me to express um my thoughts uh based on my my historical information and um you're able to add it to what you know and be honest about it yeah. Great. Yeah. There's a reason, I love it. There's, there's a reason for that. And the reason is I grew up on a farm and my father was, a, I guess you'd call it an armchair philosopher on a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> and my father always said, it doesn't matter where you go or what you want to do, just know how to behave when you get there. And that was the only caution I was ever given. So you know how some people say now that they, the children were given the talk. Mm -hmm. you know, I was never given a talk. I was just told, do what you need to do, go where you need to be, but know how to behave when you get yeah. there. And, and that was it. And when you were talking about the divisions in the country, I think Amanda Gorman, who's that 22 year old who made that brilliant presentation at the inauguration with her poem, she told us, what's going on? She said, America is not broken. She's unfinished. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the, the extraordinary thing about a democratic, a dialectical democratic republic is it is always going to be unfinished. unfinished yeah. And so who, who is in the process? We're in the process. Yeah. And all of the voices in the process are important to enhance it. And that's what the discourse has to concentrate on. Yes, there's, there's, there's yeah, much more parents. ahead. That's a great statement. Um, Dr. Twiggs, I really um, want to commend you for um, the work that you've done and also in raising your sons with those um, values and sensibilities. How many sons do you have? Three. Wow, yeah. yeah. You got a tribe going. Yeah. Do you have any daughters? <laughs> No dollars. Okay, I three got sons. I got oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet they're glad to be your granddaughters too. Oh, yeah, with three sons. Oh, yeah. oh. I'm sure they're spoiled. 
Um, I can, I, I definitely could talk to the two of you for hours and hours more. I have one last thing to discuss. I just have to slip this in. Can the two of you just talk a little bit about how I came to know both of you? And that um, I kind of wanted to segue into your family photos with this, but um, I learned about you, Dr. Twiggs, and then eventually found you, Dr. Martin, through the Harlem on My Mind artifacts. Mm -hmm. Can the two of you just briefly tell our audience what that's about? I know that doesn't just thing, but maybe just introduce the subject for a future time. Well, let, let me just tell you how, how it, got, it got connected to the Stand Back Museum. Right. Uh, I was in New Haven because uh, my wife's sister lives there. And I heard it through the grapevine, and I'm saying it that way for obvious reasons, that that exhibit that they had at Metropolitan Museum of Art was very controversial, and they had stored it at the 42nd Street Library, and that they were looking for some place to unload it. They wanted to give it away. And uh, so when I got back to South Carolina, I started writing around, and I wrote somebody there, I don't know, somebody at the museum, and they said, yes, we have it. And I said, well, we'd like to have it as a museum because we just built a new museum and I sent them pictures and of course we, our museum can take over big pictures like that. We could use them because we had a 3,500 square feet in the main gallery area. In the main gallery and yeah. very nice space. And so they said, okay, you can get them. You got to come and pick it up. I didn't know that that was going to be a problem. I thought I would go in the president's office and said, we got this exhibit. All we have to do is get somebody to pick it up in New York. He said, well, we don't know whether or not we can do that because we can't send anybody up there. And, and uh, maybe we could talk to alumni in New York and see whether they would I didn't know any alumni in New York. So what I did was I rented a 12 foot van, U-Haul, and my, planet, my uh, uh, planetarium director at the time, he was a professor over in the physics department. He decided to drive, Don, and I'll never forget that. And he went to New York and loaded that thing up. Can you imagine? <laughs> we didn't get a bigger truck. We should have gotten a bigger truck. I didn't know what they had and loaded that thing up. He said he came off a ramp and he almost turned over. Mm. And we brought those pictures to the Stand Back Museum. It was the first big collection of photographs that we had. And we just kept taking them off the truck and they were more and more and more and more. And we just stacked them away. And then when we had our exhibit, we had eight by eight foot van disease. You can stand in front of it and take a picture with it. And then I had to get a grant because I wanted them cataloged. I wanted those photographs cataloged. I, I got the original catalog from uh, the Harlem On My Mind exhibit, uh, but I wanted them cataloged and that's where Frank came in. So Frank, you can take it from there. <laughs> also talk about the Metropolitan Museum of Art not having black curators and creating a real mess in New York. Because I didn't know about that. Early on, I had read about it, but I didn't know very much about it. So the exhibition was presented in uh, 1969, and it had been, uh, there are actually, I think, three curators who were supposed to have worked on it, but the principal curator was Alan Scherner. And of course, Alan Scherner is Jewish and had a very significant success at the Jewish Museum are looking at Jewish culture. And so the Met thought, oh, well, he should be able to look at African-American culture because they wanted to become involved in what was happening in America and, and after the assassination of Dr. King in 68 and then, John, and, uh, then uh, Robert Kennedy, the museum wanted to show it had a social conscience. And the Met had been primarily these sort of elitist, primarily Western European exhibitions. And when they decided to show the Harlem on my mind works, the inadvertently, and I don't think it was intentional at all, insulted the fine artists, the painters and sculptors and printmakers who lived in Harlem because they wanted only to do photographs 
and recorded works done uh, recorded by machine. They wanted to show multimedia contemporary approaches to showing life in Harlem and giving a statement that they thought was documentary, which was anthropological and therefore insulting because it would not have been considered fine art. And that created a controversy around the exhibition, which is why Dr. Triggs was able to get those images because the Schomburg, it was too hot to handle and nobody wanted to hold on to the images. Although this had been a very, this was a, a, a groundbreaking exhibition. It transformed how exhibitions were done. It had over 200,000 visitors it uh, helped generate the idea of the blockbuster. So all of those things about that show were highly significant, but it was never appreciated within the African-American community. And if you look for scholarship about it, most people uh, present very negative views of the exhibition for those reasons, because of the context in which it was presented and how. However, what it does do is it has from the negatives and from the original photographs, of James Vanderzee, of Lord Yearwood, of you know, numerous, very significant African-American photographers, as well as others, these um, excellent images that are now in the collection at the Standback. And uh, I mean, the panels have some wear and tear because <laughs> they, they went through, as, as the young people say, they went through some things. <laughs> but the... Um, documents, the, the objects that were part of that exhibition are preserved at an HBCU and Dr. Twiggs made that possible. Now, what he didn't tell you is Don Walters, a Caucasian physicist who drove up to New York to bring these, these works back. And he brought about a total of around 400 of what were originally, I think 1400 panels. So we didn't get every single one, but we were able to, to uh, save a substantial number. And then you, and uh, Ronnie Cruz came to the museum because you were looking to try to create some sort of uh, exhibition or collaborative project with the Harlem On My Mind uh, exhibition because it was going to be a 50th, well, the 50th anniversary was in uh, 2019. 19. 19, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we did a small, we did a small uh, installation uh, at the museum, some of which is still up because COVID hit right after that. And, mm. yeah. but yeah. Yeah, we lost Lonnie in 2018. And, and um, a lot, a lot happened. Um, a lot happened between those, those few years that I got to meet you, uh, right. Frank, and to today. And then finally, speaking about Dr. Twiggs, looking at Dr. Twiggs' work, you talking about Dr. Twiggs, and now, I, I've gotten to know Dr. Twiggs a bit. I said you had to meet. But then Doreen flew me down to Miami to do a presentation <laughs> on Harlem on my mind. Really? And then we went out to uh, Crystal Bridges to do another presentation yeah. about uh, related to the Black Arts Movement. Because Doreen in her own right is a part of the sort of New York scene um, in the period from, I guess, the 70s and 80s of the what would have been the birth of hip hop, well, the height of hip hop transitioning into, but she, not that Jereen is a hip hop artist, but that she was a person who was involved in the avant-garde and sort of Harlem directed avant-garde movement in New York City. Yes, and they had a show. Lorna, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, Please. I was gonna say you worked with Lorna Simpson and Robin Kelly and, and uh, the, the uh, Howardina Pendel, that group of people um, who were creating extraordinary works that were, that were very exciting, that were um, transforming the, the idea about postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And so it Doreen is a part, is, a, yeah. is directly related to that, to that uh, manifestation of the new sort of African-American aesthetics. Well, uh, Doreen, when I met her and we started talking and she wanted some images, uh, I always admired her thorough she was <laughs> and wanting to make sure uh, those images were correct and especially even though people can't see the size of them they can hear the size of them and in their mind imagine the size of them mm -hmm. and I thought that was a great idea. Yeah and if they reflect back on this recording they can also imagine the work do more research on the work and uh, my interest is being motivated well to help others be motivated 
to do more research and to kind of delve into different subjects. Because I believe at this point, um, it's all about new ways of, of education, new, new ways of educating each other. I believe mm -hmm. programming is the way that uh, communities are, are receiving education now. Um, and I believe that family groups uh, being uh, participating in programming as a family unit, whatever family, blended family, uh, non-traditional family, that is how um, we're going to step into this new world of learn this this changed world. Um, hopefully, with a thirst for knowledge and information, and um, just to um, yeah, some of the work I had done was featured in this show. Uh, we wanted a revolution. Black radical women, nineteen eighty. 1965, I think, to 1985. And mm -hmm. so um, that show was at Brooklyn Museum and, and also at California African American Museum. And I was able to participate in some of the uh, activities um, assisting the programmers as a, as a kind of an assistant producer. Um, but it was really great um, so to see our images in the museum as young people. Um, mm -hmm. And I, we were making jokes saying, well, we wanted a revolution, but we really just wanted a gig. <laughs> we wanted a gig. <laughs> so we just started doing stuff. And I got a chance to work with wonderful artists such as Alva Rogers, Lisa Jones. Uh, we were all part of a group of young people at the time. Um, people like Kelly, Dr. Kelly Jones, Lorna Simpson, other artists were a part of that group. Um, it, this was a time during, you know, when uh, Black Rock Coalition in New York and other groups were getting together. Uh, in Brooklyn, a lot of us were from from Brooklyn and from uh, Manhattan, different parts of, of, of the boroughs in New York City. And a lot, of, you know, I used to, hey, my family is from Georgetown, South Carolina, on my mother's yeah. side. Yes. And I spent time there and also in Charleston. Wow. And um, I am looking forward to um, this new step into the unknown that we've all just taken. Yeah. Because I know there's so many more new things we're going to learn. And my parting thought is we should never get tired of learning new things. That's for because sure. Because being right. teachable is being lovable. Yes. And being alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being inquisitive. Yes. And I hope that um, we will speak again soon. I think we got the big chunk done this time. Okay. But then maybe we can have some short ones. I, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not going to stop bothering y'all. I'm sorry. I think we've almost got three hours. <laughs> yes, we did just about. I want to thank both of you, Dr. Leo Twiggs, Dr. Frank Martin. You have been extremely gracious with your time and attention through this process. Um, I really look forward to speaking with you again. And I want to thank um, everyone who made this possible. And I will list them in description boxes moving forward. <laughs> I'm Doreen Young, and this is The Audio Percolator. Have a great evening, both of you. Thank you so much, really. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.